Today we are looking at a case from the very end of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Augusta Nack was born on the 5th of April 1860 in a small village, which at the time of her birth was in Prussia, but is now in present day Germany. She attended the local primary school with her two sisters and the rural life that she lived seemed quite idyllic for a young girl in the 1860s. Her father was a farmer and Augusta would often help him with the chickens and the geese. But when she was still young, her father tragically died. Life suddenly changed for Augusta and her sisters. It was not easy for their mother to manage the farm and from living a comfortable lifestyle, the family started to experience hardship. When Augusta was 11 years old, she went to work for a wealthy gentleman who lived in the village. Her tasks were mainly in the kitchen, helping to prepare food and collecting the vegetables. The days were long and Augusta would have to get up early to make sure that she was able to complete all of her duties. When she was 18 years old, she moved to the city of Kiel that sits on the Baltic Sea where she worked in domestic service for a well-to-do family. It was here that she met Mr. Herman Knack. They started to go out and eventually he proposed to her. She happily accepted and soon after they got married. Life continued as normal for the couple and over the next few years, Augusta gave birth to two children, a boy and a girl. However, things were not easy for them. Germany had suffered a depression that had started in 1873. The prices for agricultural and industrial goods fell and for six successive years, the net national product declined. Many corporations went bankrupt and in agriculture, the country faced severe competition as surplus American and Russian grain flooded the German market. Much of this hardship was felt in the depressed province of rural Prussia, so much so that in the 1870s, some 600,000 people departed for North and South America. People in this part of Europe had been migrating across the Atlantic since the beginning of the 19th century, but it was the 1880s that saw the highest number of German citizens making the journey. It is estimated that during that decade, nearly 1.5 million Germans left their homeland and sought a new life in America. Augusta and Hermann also made the decision to move. Tragedy had struck them when their little boy had died. So along with their daughter, they boarded a ship bound for New York. They had both worked hard in Germany and continued to do so in America. They saved enough money to start their own delicatessen, which they opened on 10th Avenue and it looked as though things were starting to go well for them. However, they again experienced tragedy. When their daughter died, she was only four years old. Augusta was totally devastated by the loss of her two children. Herman would try to comfort her, but she was inconsolable. As the months passed, problems started to appear in their marriage. Herman would leave the store, only to return hours later in a state of drunkenness. As this continued, he began to spend more and more of the profits. Things deteriorated further and eventually, Augusta told him that she had had enough of his behaviour and would have nothing more to do with him. But being a single woman in 1890s New York was difficult and Augusta was unable to keep the lease on the delicatessen. When living in Germany, she had acquired some nursing skills. So she decided that she would set up as a midwife. She moved to a property from which she was able to conduct such a business and announced that she was now a midwife. On the 26th of June, 1897, a disturbing incident unfolded in New York City when a portion of a human body, excluding the head, was discovered wrapped in red oil cloth in the East River near 11th Street. At first, the police believed that this was probably part of a body that had been discarded by medical students. But as the pathologist looked more closely, he concluded that this body part may have found its way into the East River by way of something more sinister. The police had nothing to go on, so remained open-minded about the discovery. Later the same day, another package, equally as chilling, was found by two teenage boys who had been swimming near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It was two human legs, which were also wrapped in oilcloth. The following day, in a separate location, a gentleman named Julius Meyer was out with his two young sons. 
The boys saw a package lying against a wall. It was wrapped in red oilcloth and bound by twine. The boys started to open it, but the smell was so bad. They decided to call their father. Mr. Meyer peered into the package, then immediately instructed his sons to find a policeman. As they did, the gentleman stood guard over the package. When policeman Andrew Brunner and Thomas Farley arrived, they saw that inside the package was the lower part of a human body. A patrol wagon was summoned and the gruesome discovery was taken to the Highbridge Police Station. All of the body parts from the different locations were then collected and taken to the Highbridge Mortuary, where Deputy Police Coroner O'Hanlon conducted an autopsy. He concluded that all of the body parts belonged to the same person, a well-built male, who had been about 5 foot 10 inches tall and who was around 35 years of age. The coroner added that this man had been subjected to stab wounds, including one through the heart, and had been dead for no longer than 36 hours. The coroner also believed that the person who had dismembered the body would have undoubtedly received some training in this field. The oil cloth was an interesting clue, as there were only two wholesale companies in New York that supplied this product. One was named H. Fuerstein and Sons, and on inspection, the oil cloth they supplied matched perfectly with the oil cloth that the body parts had been wrapped in. The detectives then set out to contact all the retailers who sold the oil cloth. However, they had to try and identify the body. It was a task that was going to be difficult, as no head had been found. The news was soon shared with the media in New York City, who were very aware that this mysterious case would fascinate their readers. The newspapers filled their columns with information of the grisly discovery, and soon a woman came to the Highbridge mortuary to let the police know that she believed the body belonged to her brother-in-law, a gentleman named Mr. Max Carvenkel, who had been missing for several days. However, after a brief inspection, she realised that the body was not the missing gentleman. As the newspapers wrote more about the mystery, the name of Mr. William Golden Zupa started to be mentioned. He was a masseur at the Murray Hills Baths, but had recently gone missing. Frank Gartner, an attendant at the baths, who had frequently seen the gentleman partially unclothed, visited the mortuary and after looking at the headless body, confidently identified it to be that of Mr. William Gordon Zupa. He said that he was certain as there were some distinctive marks on the body, including a tattoo which the person who had committed this crime had attempted to remove. The police then asked other employees at the bath to come and look at the deceased man, who were equally certain that it was indeed Mr. Golden Zupa. To confirm the identity, a practitioner named Dr. J.S. Cosby examined the deceased. He saw that the index finger of the left hand had a scar. This had been caused following the treatment that he had administered to help cure an abscess for Mr. Golden Zupa. Following the positive identification made by the doctor and the workers at the Murray Hill Baths, police were confident the headless body belonged to Mr. William Gordon Zupa. Investigations revealed that the gentleman had been residing with a midwife named Mrs. Augusta Knack at 339 Fifth Avenue, and on speaking to neighbours, they discovered that the couple had recently quarrelled due to one of the party's indiscretions. The authorities went to Mrs. Knack's apartment and found that she was preparing to leave for Europe. They took her into custody. Strangely, however, when asked about Mr. Gordon Zupa's whereabouts, she claimed to have no knowledge of where he might be and had no concern for his fate. The police wondered if the lady's estranged husband may have been responsible for this most horrible crime, so arrested Mr. Herman Knack. He protested his innocence, and when his alibi was confirmed, he was released. A lady came to the police station and told officers that her husband was named Mr. John Gotha and worked as a barber. She said that he had recited to her a very interesting tale that had apparently been told to him by another barber named Mr. Martin Thorne. She said that her husband had not wanted to speak about this to the police. Acting Inspector O'Brien sent officers to speak to Mr. Gotha. They then escorted him back to the police station. The gentleman told detectives a very intriguing story. He said that he had been talking to another barber named Mr. Martin Thorne, who he had known for around 10 years. He knew that Mr. Thorne lived with Mrs. Knack and he had also met her on several occasions. 
He told of how Mr Thorne had rented a room at Mrs Knack's house, and when Mr Golden Super was absent, they participated in an improper relationship. He went on to say that Mr Thorne had said that one evening, Mr Golden Super returned home to discover Mr Thorne and Mrs Knack in bed together. A heated argument ensued, resulting in Mr Golden Super attacking Mr Thorne in a manner that required Mr Thorne to seek medical assistance. Subsequently, Mr Thorne relocated to her residence on 3rd Avenue and 21st Street. During this time, Mrs Knack would secretly visit him, offering financial assistance and expressing her desire to leave Mr Gordon Super and live with him. Mr Gotha went on to say that on the 22nd of June, Mr Thorne had apparently seen an advertisement in a newspaper which displayed the availability of a cottage for rent at 346 Second Street, Woodside, on Long Island. He said that Mr Thorne and Mrs Knack went to see the property on the 24th of June. It was a nice cottage that suited their requirements, so they decided to rent it. They then paid a $15 down payment, saying they were a married couple named Mr and Mrs Braun. Mr Gotha told officers of Mr Thorne's determination to seek revenge against his rival, and this had led him to purchase a pistol and a knife for that specific purpose. He then claimed that Mr Thorne had told him that on the 25th of June, Mrs Knack had asked Mr Gordon Super to visit the new house, but unbeknown to the gentleman, Mr Thorne was hiding behind the door, and when the gentleman arrived and went upstairs, Mr Thorne shot him in the back of the head. Mr Gotha added that at the time, Mrs Knack was outside. He continued his story and said that the gentleman was still breathing, so Mr Thorne placed him in the bathtub and finished him off with the knife. He added that following this, Mrs Knack went to purchase oilcloth, while Mr Thorne cut up the body. The severed head was then covered in plaster of Paris and bandages before being discarded into the river. The body parts were wrapped in oilcloth and placed in different areas of the city. The police had been searching for Mr Thorne, but following the statement from Mr Gotha, acting Inspector O'Brien, apprehended him and escorted him to the police station for questioning. Mr Thorne denied that he had murdered Mr Golden Super. He claimed that upon entering the house on the 25th of June, he discovered that Mrs Knack had already killed the gentleman and claimed that his involvement in the crime was limited to assisting her with disposing of the body parts. The police were finding more clues. A carving knife, a saw and a revolver were found in the cottage, all stained with human blood. In early July 1897, Mrs Augusta Knack was charged with the murder of Mr William Gordon Super. Mr Martin Thorne was charged with the same crime a few days later. Their trials were held separately, with Mrs Knack's being held first. It took place in Long Island and fascinated the public, so much so that it became known as one of the most significant trials of the 1890s. To accommodate the media, the courtroom reserved seats for 72 reporters, ensuring that they all had dedicated space to cover the proceedings. Additionally, provisions were made for 10 telegraph lines, highlighting the significance of the trial and the need for efficient communication of updates to the public and media outlets. The prosecution presented a compelling case, alleging that the defendant had killed the man that she lived with and had conspired with her accomplice, Mr Martin Thorne, to dispose of his remains. The evidence included witness testimonies, physical items found at the crime scene and the confession of Mr Thorne that she had indeed shot Mr Gordon Super. Witnesses such as Max Rieger and his wife identified Mrs Knack as a woman who had purchased red oil cloth from their store, similar to one in which the deceased body parts had been wrapped. Additionally, the discovery of a carving knife, a saw and a revolver at the cottage where Mrs Knack and Mr Thorne resided further supported the prosecution's case. Human blood was found on these items, connecting them to the gruesome act. The prosecution questioned what type of midwife Mrs Knack was and implied that she actually performed illegal terminations. Mrs Knack denied this. She also denied that she had shot Mr Golden Zupa, saying that it was all done by Mr Thorne because he was jealous of her relationship with him and because he was angered after Mr Golden Zupa had assaulted him. 
She said that she was actually afraid of Mr Thorne. But if Fence was led by William Howe, a very prominent attorney of the time, he attempted to challenge the prosecution's case by questioning the credibility of the witnesses and the validity of the evidence. He made out that Mrs Knack was in fact a victim of both Mr Gordon Super and Mr Thorne and that she was a woman who had been living in fear of both men. As the trial neared its end, Mrs Augusta Knack accepted a lesser charge of manslaughter in the first degree and agreed to testify against Mr Martin Thorne. She was sentenced to serve 15 years in prison for her role in the heinous crime. The trial marked the end of a sensational and widely followed legal proceeding. Mrs Knack was left to face the consequences of her actions while the public continued to reflect on the tragic case. The trial of Mr Thorne followed and was another media sensation. He told the court of how he had left Germany 17 years earlier and when he took a room at Mrs Knack's property he paid her rent of $2 a week and at first believed that Mr Gordon Zuppa was her husband. He later realised that he was not and he and Mrs Knack started a relationship. He told of how the lady had wanted to leave the deceased so took a cottage at 346 2nd Street in Long Island. It was here that on the 25th of June he went to see Mrs Knack but when she came to the door she told him that she had shot Mr Gordon Super. He said it was her that cut up the body. However during the trial a man named Constantine Kean, who worked as a barber and was an acquaintance of Mr Thorne testified that Mr Thorne had previously told him that he had received surgical training in Germany. This testimony strengthened the prosecution's arguments that Mr Thorne possessed the knowledge required to dismember Mr Gordon Zuper's body. Mr Thorne did admit that he had lied to Captain O'Brien about his whereabouts on the day of the murder. He said that he had done this with a view of trying to establish an alibi. He denied that he took money from Mrs Knack saying he only did this to secure the cottage and that he had used a false name in doing so as Mrs Knack did not want people to realise that they were living together. It was also revealed that there was a letter that Mrs Knack had written to Mr Thorne while she was in the Queen's County Prison. She had asked if he could send her something to end her life. Mr Thorne however told the court that he did not want to do this as he loved her and wanted to see her free. When asked if he was willing to die for her, he replied that he was. Mr John Gotha was a crucial witness. Although he had told the police about Mr Thorne's confession that he had made to him, the defence confirmed that Mr Gotha had in fact been paid $100 reward for his testimony and they questioned whether he could actually be believed. The trial lasted for six days and on the 30th of November 1897, Mr Martin Thorne was found to be guilty of the murder of Mr William Gordon Zuppa and the judge sentenced him to death. His sentence was appealed but it was upheld. Mr Martin Thorne was executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison on the 1st of August 1898. Mrs Augusta Knack did not serve her full sentence. She was released from prison in July 1908 after serving only nine years. She opened a shop but after people realised who she was she closed it down. She opened another one but it had the same fate. She then lived out her life in relative obscurity in New Jersey. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.